Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never practice nunchucks in a crowded room. Never eat chole before a road trip. Always take your shirt off before you iron it. Don't take a call near a swimming pool. And don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. Hi, and welcome to this episode of the Print Security Code. Thank you for being loyal viewers of this program and others from the print. As you know, the prints developed the loyalty of viewers and readers like you because of its high quality on-ground reporting and deeply researched explainers. But quality journalism needs money. I request you to take a subscription to the print. You can find the link in the description below. Looming over Tel Aviv from its perch on a low dry hill north of the city, the guest house was equipped with the amenities of a five-star hotel, plush rooms, conference facilities, a kitchen with a full-time chef, a swimming pool, a gym, a private movie theatre. But Trident House made no effort to market itself. The Yellow Wing only served visitors from Turkey's intelligence service. The Blue Wing was reserved for guests from the sazman e etilat e amniyat e keshwar or SAVAK, the Shah of Iran's notoriously brutal espionage agency. Today, as Iranian missiles and drones loom over Israel, threatening to spark off a region-wide war which could have profound global consequences, it is hard to imagine that these two countries were once close allies. Israel's Mossad and Savak partnered with the Turkish intelligence agency in a kind of secret North Atlantic Treaty organization called Trident, which surveilled the entire Mediterranean and the Middle East. Israel, the scholar Trita Parsi records, even built the production facility at Sirjan and the test facility at Karg Island, which laid the foundations for Iran's guided missile program, part of a $280 million project codenamed Flower. Israel's aid was intended to secure its ally from Saddam Hussein's Iraq and the Soviet Union. The story teaches us what happens when ideology and hubris overtake calm, rational decision-making based on national interests. However, it also offers hope, showing that the confrontation in the Middle East is neither inevitable nor permanent. The cynical politics that have led Iran and Israel to the edge of war do not reflect the true national interests of either or of the global system in which they are both enmeshed. For decades before war erupted in Gaza, many experts had been predicting a showdown between the region's two major powers. Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons capabilities was a consequence of its theocratic regime's fears, fears of being destroyed by the West. Iran, the United States Defense Intelligence Agency noted in a review of the Islamic Republic's capabilities, also developed missile and access denial tools needed to face down technologically advanced Western militaries, I quote, aiming to raise the human cost and financial cost to a potential adversary to deter an attack. Together with Iran's cultivation of irregular military forces like Hamas or Hezbollah, the accumulation of power by Tehran posed an existential threat to Israel. Ever since the revolution of 1979, the cleric who ruled Iran had made no secret of their loathing for Israel. The Jews, Rolla Khomeini claimed, were seeking to obliterate Islam, necessitating war against their nation. Iran did little though to act on the hostile polemic of its leadership. And that led some in Israel to explore the possibilities of a diplomatic opening. Early in the Islamic Republic's life, Iran's war with Iraq led Tehran into a desperate search for equipment to resupply its sanctions-hit military. Israeli intelligence operatives, historians Farhad Razai and Ronan Cohen record, reached out to Iranian moderates through clandestine networks of international arms traffickers. From 1981 to 1983, Israel secretly shipped 
$500 million worth of parts for warplanes and tanks to Iran in defiance of United States sanctions, a relationship that would later mature into President Ronald Reagan's plans to funnel off a part of the profits to fund anti-communist insurgents in Nicaragua. Israeli Prime Minister Shimon Peres wrote to Reagan in 1986, urging continued engagement with Iran despite its proxies kidnapping Americans in Lebanon. I quote, it is my firm conviction that the fundamental change we both seek as to the direction of the country in which we are dealing holds promise not only for our two countries, but for many others in the regions and in the free world, Prime Minister Perez wrote. Even if this assessment seems wrong now, it was far from delusional. Ever since its independence, Israel had realized its near neighbor shared a common interest in containing threats from the growing power of Arab nationalism. Iran had granted Israel de facto acknowledgement in 1950, and though it held back from formal diplomatic recognition, an embassy functioned from unmarked premises. Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir, among others, visited Iran secretly, landing in darkness at the Mehrabad airstrip outside Tehran. Lawyer Ethe Mack, who has extensively studied Israel's declassified diplomatic documentation on its ties with Iran, discovered a 1967 appraisal by de facto Ambassador V. Dorel. We have established a close, friendly and practical relationship between the Israel Defense Forces and the Security Services and their Iranian counterparts with joint execution of programs and missions of national importance. Various security problems vital to Israel have been solved in close cooperation with the Iranians. Enmeshed geopolitical events, though, led this nascent Iran-Israel detente to implode. For one, the levelling of Saddam Hussein's regime in the first Gulf War of 1990 removed the mutual security threat or common enemy that had led Israel and Iran to seek accommodation in the first place. Then, the disintegration of the Soviet Union reassured Iran it no longer faced the risk of an invasion targeting its oil fields in the province of Khuzestan. From 1992, as news of Iran's nuclear ambitions began to emerge and the Israeli-Palestinian peace process bogged down, Tel Aviv started to work to isolate its sole remaining threat in the region, which was now Iran. Following 9-11, Iran sought to break the impasse, routing secret peace proposals through Tehran-based Swiss diplomat Tim Gildeman. In return, for civilian nuclear technology and an end to sanctions, the Iranians offered to limit their mu missile program, stop supporting terrorist groups and terminate production of weapons-grade uranium. But the proposals were ignored by US President George Bush, who cast Iran as part of an axis of evil he targeted for regime change. Later, this idea would be revisited by President Barack Obama, who pushed forward with the Iran nuclear deal. That deal remained stalled in the face of resistance from Israel and Republicans in the United States. Israel's successful isolation of Iran, though, hasn't really brought it security. Instead, Israel remains vulnerable to Iranian affiliates or proxies like Hamas, journalist Amos Harel noted in a superb article last month. Having secured few of its strategic aims in a war that increasingly appears unwinnable, Israel needs to think about how it might engage Iran on these issues. This month's bombing of Iran's diplomatic mission in Damascus and the inevitable Iranian response might have allowed Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to draw the United States deeper into the conflict. But this won't address Israel's vulnerability to rocket attacks from Iranian proxies like Hezbollah or from Tehran itself. Even though many in Israel consider the prospect of an Iranian atomic weapon somewhere in the future enough to justify the costs of war today, nuclear warfare scholar Kenneth Waltz has argued mutual deterrence will, in fact, make Middle East wars less likely, thus addressing Tel Aviv's existential fears. For nuclear optimists like Waltz, nuclear weapons are a means of ensuring nation states do not go to war with each other, since all a war would give them is complete annihilation themselves. 
Iran, isolated and desperate to secure deterrence through conventional means, has proved more dangerous as an adversary than one which is engaged diplomatically and enmeshed in the international order. So China and India, who are now the largest importers of oil from the Middle East, will disproportionately pay the price, like high oil prices and trade shocks that will come should war escalate, the entire world will suffer. And if the world suffers, so will Israel. As they did in the 1950s, Israel and Iran have common shared interests today. Even if one is ruled by a prime minister eager to ensure his survival by stoking crisis, and the other is led by religious fanatics eager to crush domestic political opposition by fueling anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. The two nations both know they face common threats from jihadists who want to destroy both and from instability in the Middle East. They both face economic challenges which cannot be addressed without peace. Letting ideology and domestic politics shaped the Iran-Israel relationship has now led the Middle East's two biggest powers into a terrible cul-de-sac. The time to change course is now. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm a contributing editor at The Print. Thank you for watching this episode of Security Code.